that Columbus discovered America is perhaps the greatest falsehood universally taught in schools. The fact is that Columbus never discovered America. When Christopher Columbus set foot on American soil in 1492, the Native Americans were living there and the Native American civilization was at that time at least 15,000 years old. And it was a civilization which existed in perfect harmony with nature, unlike the Western civilization represented by Christopher Columbus. If you want to understand the soul of America, you have to understand the Native American civilization. And if you want to understand the soul of the Native American civilization, you have to understand Chief Seattle's speech. Let us read the speech. Chief Seattle is arguably the most illustrious figure in the history of the Native American civilization. He was a heroic warrior, a profound philosopher, a powerful speaker, an efficient administrator, and above all, a wise statesman. His achievements are immortalized today through numerous monuments built in his honor, through the several statues and busts erected in his honor, and of course through the name of the city of Seattle. The iconic speech of Chief Seattle was delivered during the negotiations he conducted on behalf of his tribe with the white administration of Washington territories and it was delivered in the presence of the governor of Washington territories Isaac Stevens in the year 1854. The speech opens with a striking sentence. The speaker says that for innumerable centuries the sky has rained compassion on the forefathers of the speaker and it appears that this is eternal but the fact is that it is likely to change. The speaker thus admits that he is standing at a cusp in history. The balance of power has shifted in favor of the white settlers. There was a time when the Native Americans had complete sway over the land, but their hegemony is coming to an end. It has to be accepted. Chief Seattle refuses to lay the cause of the decline and fall of the Native American civilization solely at the door of the white settler. It was not merely the hostility of the white settler that resulted in the untimely decay of the Native American civilization. There were strong internal factors which aggravated 
this decline. The cruelty, the warmongering, the thirst for revenge among the Native American tribes largely led to the downfall of the civilization. Now the Native Americans have to accept the protection of the white administration. But Chief Seattle has no complaints about it. It is clear from his speech that the Native American tribes were not homogeneous or even united. And Chief Seattle expresses the hope that the white administration will protect his tribe against the rival tribes. Chief Seattle now comes to the matter of religion. The white man's God protects the white man and leads him as a father leads his son. It appears that this God has forsaken his red children. The white man is growing stronger day by day while the red man is growing weaker. The point that Chief Seattle wants to make is that the Native Americans and the white settlers are two distinct races with little in common between them. This is a fact. It has to be accepted. The speaker now works out a sharp contrast between the religion of the Native American and the religion of the white settler. For the Native American, his ancestors are holy. Their ashes are sacred. The places where they are cremated are holy ground. And the ancestors, according to the Native American, keep coming to this world because they love this world, because they love their native land. Day and night cannot coexist. Similarly, the white settler of the Native American cannot live together. The white administration was planning to buy land from Chief Seattle and his tribe. The white administration promised to give reservations to Chief Seattle and his tribe. And Seattle says that he and his tribesmen hope to live in those reservations cut off from the civilization of the white settler. Chief Seattle now strikes a very different note. He points out that there is something common to all human beings, whether they are red or white, and that is death. No Native American can escape death. And the same is true of the white man. The white man's God speaks to the white man as friend to friend, but the white man cannot escape the final destiny of death, just as the red man cannot escape from it. After all, Chief Seattle says, the red man and the white man, the native American and the European settler may be brothers, may be brothers. The white administration had put forward a proposition to purchase the lands under the control of Chief Seattle and his tribe. In this speech, Chief Seattle says that they shall ponder over this proposition. They are ready to accept it, but only on conditions. And the first of these is that 
the red men shall be allowed to visit the graves of their ancestors. The red men shall be allowed to pay their respects to the dead ancestors of theirs. For the Native Americans, every part of the country is sacred. The hillsides, the valleys, everything is sacred. And they should be allowed to live in harmony with nature. Chief Seattle says that a time may come when the Native Americans become extinct and then the white men may think that they are alone on the continent but this is not true for according to Chief Seattle according to the perspectives of the Native Americans the dead are not dead they return to this world and even after the last Native American is dead and gone and the white settlers think that they are alone these dead red Indians will return as hosts to this world and Chief Seattle appeals to the white administration to be kind to the Native Americans because according to him the dead are not completely powerless. The speech of Chief Seattle paints a brilliant picture of the socio-political context in which it is cited. It is very clear from the speech that the American society at that point of time was divided between the Native Americans on the one hand and the white settlers on the other. As the speaker very clearly puts it, night and day cannot coexist. The Native American and the white settler cannot coexist because they belong to two very different civilizations, two very different cultures. We also get a glimpse of the political scenario of the America of the day. It is obvious that the balance of power has shifted in favor of the white settler and that the Native American is at the mercy of the white settler. It may be pointed out that Chief Se Seattle adopted an approach of accommodation and adjustment towards the white administration. Far-sighted statesman that he was, white statesman that he was, Chief Seattle understood that he had no better alternative. From the speech of Chief Seattle, we get a sharply etched picture of the cultural and religious circumstances of the day. Chief Seattle gives an overview of the religion of the Native Americans. And this is a religion which is obsessed with ancestor worship, which is focused on the love of the land and which believes in living in harmony with nature. On the other hand, the God of the white man speaks to him as friend to friend. The God of the white man is far away and far above him. Similarly, there are spectacular cultural differences between the red men and the white men. The civilization of the Native American has very little in common 
with the civilization of the European. That is why at one point in the oration, the speaker admits that the two, the Native American and the white settler, cannot coexist. They are like night and day. They can never ever be brothers. It may be observed that Chief Seattle displays a remarkable understanding of the Christian religion and also that at a late stage in his life Chief Seattle embraced Christianity and became, if I am not wrong, a Catholic. The speech of Chief Seattle was delivered at a cusp in American history. It was a turning point in the chronicles of America. The white settler had become all-powerful. The Native American was at the mercy of the white settler. That is why Chief Seattle, the wise statesman that he was, adopted an approach of accommodation and adjustment towards the white settler. The white administration put forward a proposal to purchase the lands under the control of Chief Seattle and his tribe. Chief Seattle in his speech promises to consider the proposal on condition that the Native Americans are given the right to worship their ancestors and visit the graves of their ancestors and carry out their religious and cultural practices unmolested. The lands would be bought by the white administration, but there would be reservations. Reservations are areas set aside for the Native Americans, where the Native Americans can live in peace and follow their culture and practice their religion. Through his speech, Chief Seattle makes a fervent appeal to the white settlers to adopt a positive approach towards the Native Americans, not merely towards the Native Americans, but also towards the land and its nature. Chief Seattle's speech gives us a graphic picture of the Native American civilization. It is a civilization which is thousands of years old and the speaker displays his awareness of this fact. It is a civilization with its own religion, with its own faith, with its own customs. It is a civilization rooted in the soil of America. The land, the plains, the groves, the valleys are all sacred to the Native Americans. It is a civilization which believes in continuity. That is why they practice ancestor worship. The resting places of the ancestors are sacred to them. It is a, it is a civilization whose basic principles are written in the heart of the people. It is a civilization which is close to nature, which loves nature, which looks upon nature as a mother rather than as a resource to be exploited. The speaker makes it clear that once upon a time the Native American civilization held sway over the entire continent. The days of glory are over. And now that civilization is experiencing an untimely decline. The speaker also makes it clear that the Native American civilization is a civilization which has produced heroes, warriors, great achievers. 
it is possible to read the speech of Chief Seattle as the Magna Carta of indigenous peoples. The Magna Carta of the Great Charter was signed by King John at Runnymede near Windsor in 1215. June the 15th, 1215, if I'm not wrong. Through the Great Charter, King John guarantees certain rights to his nobles. We can try to see the speech of Chief Seattle as a sort of Magna Carta of indigenous peoples. It is a fact that the speech was delivered by Chief Seattle at a crucial point in the history of America. The Native Americans were preparing to surrender their lands to the white settlers. Chief Seattle realized that giving up the lands to the white settlers was the best option before him. But we have to remember that it was not a one-sided bargain. Chief Seattle makes it very clear that they are willing, the Native Americans are willing to consider the proposition of giving up their lands only on certain conditions. And Chief Seattle lists these conditions and makes it clear that these rights of the indigenous people have to be respected and guaranteed by the white administration. First of all, Chief Seattle wants the Native Americans to enjoy the right to visit the resting places of their ancestors. The Native Americans practiced ancestor worship and the resting places of their ancestors, the ashes of their ancestors, are sacred to them. So, the Native Americans must have the freedom to visit the resting places of their ancestors unmolested. Chief Seattle speaks of reservations. Reservations are areas of land set aside for the occupation of the indigenous people. Chief Seattle accepts that there is much that is sharply different between the white settlers and the Native Americans, the civilization of the white settlers and the civilization of the Native Americans. So, the speaker wants the right to live in the reservations unmolested by the white settlers. The speaker agrees that it is better to live apart in peace because there is not much in common between the white man and the red man. It is clear from the tone of the speech that Chief Seattle expects the white settlers to treat the Native Americans with respect and consideration. He wants the protection of the forces, of the military forces of the white administration. It is significant that Chief Seattle does not conclude his speech on a note of submission, but on a note of warning. He says that even after the Native Americans become extinct. The dead Native Americans will at night throng the streets of the cities and villages of America. And Chief Seattle warns his listeners that the dead are not entirely powerless. It is possible to see Chief Seattle's speech as a sort of Magna Carta of indigenous peoples. In this speech, the speaker asks for certain 
rights and declares that only if these rights are granted the lands to be transferred from the Native American tribes to the white settlers will be handed over. These rights include the right to live in reservations, the right to live apart from the white settlers, the right to practice their religion and culture, the right to worship at the resting places of their ancestors, the right to continue to live and love, to live in and to love the land. Eco-theory rose to prominence in the 1980s and the 1990s, but the speech delivered by Chief Seattle a century earlier can very well be looked upon as one of the foundational texts of eco-theory. Much of what is looked upon as the cardinal principles of eco-theory are embedded in the text of the speech. Chief Seattle highlights the role played by nature in the life of the Native American. The Native American civilization looks upon nature as a mother rather than as a resource to be exploited. The Native Americans love the land, the valleys, the plains, the grouse, and they live in harmony with nature. So great is their love for the land that they believe that their dead ancestors, their dead ancestors do not go to faraway places, to heaven or to hell, but return to the land because so great is their love of the land. Even the language used by Chief Seattle is very much the language of a nature lover. He frequently draws his imagery, frequently draws his figures of speech from nature. It is difficult for him to speak for some time without bringing in some aspect of nature. Under these circumstances, it is only natural that eco-theorists celebrate the speech of Chief Seattle as one of the foundational texts of eco-theory. When I attempt a stylistic analysis of the speech of Chief Seattle, I am very much alive to the objection that can be raised against it, against such an attempt. The speech of Chief Seattle was delivered not in the English language. It was delivered in Lashut Seed, the Native American language of the chief, which is more or less extinct today. And from Lashut Seed, it was translated into Chinook, the Chinook trade jargon. And it was from Chinook that it was then translated into English. Be that as it may, I would like to attempt a stylistic analysis of the speech. Eyewitnesses have recorded that Chief Seattle, an extremely tall and broad-shouldered man, delivered the speech with great dignity, with tremendous force and power. And even those who did not understand what he said 
for he spoke in Lashut Seed, realized that they had listened to a great oration when the speech came to an end. There is no doubt that cheap Seattle speech is a piece of great literary merit. The diction is simple, dignified and appropriate. The imagery is powerful and vivid. The images are mostly drawn from nature. The speaker makes use of several striking figures of speech. For example, early in the speech, the speaker says, my words are like the stars which never set. A very appropriate and striking simile. My words are like the stars which never set. The speaker makes use of powerful rhetorical questions. For example, how then can we become brothers? How then can we become brothers? A rhetorical question is not a question which is posed in order to obtain an answer, but a question which is posed in order to create an effect. A rhetorical question is actually a statement presented in the form of a question in order to create a more powerful impact. Chief Seattle makes effective use of alliteration and assonance, figures of speech in which sounds are repeated, consonant sounds and vowel sounds, as in we will ponder your proposition. We will ponder your proposition. A striking feature of the speech is that it is provided with an impressive conclusion. As I've already pointed out, Chief Seattle ends his speech not on a note of submission, but on a note of warning. Let me try to remember the words. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people, for the dead are not altogether powerless. The one feature which stands out in Chief Seattle's speech is sincerity. The speaker may not have been highly educated. The speaker may not have been highly informed. In fact, the speaker mentions George Washington as if he were alive. While the fact was that George Washington, the first president of the United States, had breathed his last more than half a century earlier. But the fact remains that the speech of Chief Seattle contains the honest words of an honest man. Chief Seattle's speech throws light on the socio-political and economic conditions of the day. From the speech we can understand that the red, the red men and the white men form two very different societies and in order to live in peace they have to live apart from each other. It is also clear that the balance of power has shifted in favor of the white men and the red men have to accept this fact. The speech details the historical circumstances which threw up the need for such a speech. The white administration of Washington decided to purchase the lands under the control of the Native Americans. And the Native American tribes 
under the leadership of Chief Seattle, decided to part with the land, decided to surrender the land to the white settlers on condition that their rights would be protected. Above all, the speech highlights the cultural richness, the cultural diversity, the cultural complexity of America in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, or in the second half of the 19th century.